So the 5414, make sure it's V2. Oh, okay. <laughs> really, really, really nice. All right, safe travels. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Very nice to meet you. Stay home. Good luck with everything. Bro. Thank you. Um, I was on the Ireland Monday, and Angie that works with the Washington Transplant Group. And uh, several years ago, we uh, started a program to try to grow and accept more uh, sending criteria or So it was the abbreviated open protocol and the operating room. We were turning down more organs at the last minute, we accepted more in the beginning, and then. Um, uh, they were either poor organ quality or the group of some of our sicker patients, higher mail, had to cancel at the last minute. And that number began to grow as we looked at one more of course throughout the regions. Um, these laid off organ declines led to a lot of physical waste and financial waste in our operating room. And it did stress out the operating room team that was our building project. So our protocol goal was to be as ready as we possibly could be to waste little time and money while looking at as many organs as we could. So it was an opportunity for the nursing team, the surgeons, and the anesthesia to come together and make a, a plan to be ready, but not wasteful. So um, an hour before the patient came to, came to the room, we would still have them in the upper, in the holding area. The nurse would go see them. We would have open just a few items that back table covers and instruments. Those would be most expensive for, uh, in time consuming items for the week. Or set up there after that, the other things took about three to four minutes to uh, just open. So from um, just at Barnes Hospital from 2018 to 2015, there was 22 with the actual work. That's when we started having the first So, this is our original poster that we made for this in the operating room. We had about 14 or 15 items that were shared individually. And through a couple of different revisions, we came up with a blank and kept individuals from opening and extra items like one of the other. We had seven games to start and we reduced the four. So our this is our newest version with the abbreviated open pack. It was a few dollars less. And like I said, it keeps people from so I'm just gonna open one more item, one more thing, and then by the end of it you an expensive set. So we have the pack in the room, we'd have ice made in case they wanted to consider. Looking at the back table of the liver, uh, the scrub roll, the open shaking down their items. And the uh, nurse would be ready. The uh, basin with all the carnivals in the pack had um, were set in order so they could count down the list from our account. So we took the average cost of, of the four surgeons that were doing uh, transplants by their uh, preference card. So we, we opened all the things on the preference card. Column two was one of the cost for us, <clears throat> excuse me, to set up. And if we cancel minus the abbreviated open pack, we have this for it is about twelve hundred sixty-five dollars per cancellation. So through 2018 to 2022, we uh, kept track of the number of cases scheduled and performed to get the numbers canceled. And each year it was pretty close to about $140,000 plus, depending on how many offers we had that year. So over the five years that we could count with Epic, it's been just under a million dollars that we've saved with our nursing team. The, uh, we did do this from 2015 to 2018 with an older computer system, and the, those years were between seventy-five and ninety-five thousand dollars, so it's just around one point two million over the last uh, little less than a decade. So we used our abbreviated COVID uh, protocol to reduce waste. Cost and delays. The other item was with the anesthesia portion of our plan. 
we would have them to say no. So if they said, it, okay, we're going to come back now, we are coming back now. So we, it was, we didn't waste money, we didn't waste time, because patients were ready when we were that we could go about getting the transplant done up to the ICU. Um, one additional thing that I didn't have a slide on is the, for those of you that don't have an operating room nursing team, we've done this with as little as four people and as many as 15 people and each person that hired on you was indoctrinated into this so they didn't have the, the previous experience of going and everything they were doing. So um, but we've been able to really keep this going consistently. There's very few times that the fact actually gets both so. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks, Maria. But this paper uh, will uh, now be discussed by Dr. Rossi. Thank you so much. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, thank you so much for presenting this uh, talk. It was a great talk. I learned a lot. I think it's very important point that you're bringing up how can we save costs in this environment. I had some questions regarding the abbreviated open protocol. And some of the uh, things that accompany why we're doing liver transplantation. Number one, did you notice any increase in the ischemia time for the implant because of this protocol? Now we know that also because the OR cost can be dictated by a prolonged OR time. Did it affect in any way the OR length of stay for that particular cases? My yeah. second question would be. Can there be any other measures that you think can be taken in order to reduce the OR time, such as maybe a pre op or the uh, optimize a bit? You won't open up the link there. And it's not very good. Like, see, other things here, you know, it's in place in case you can know, all these numbers. My other question was uh, regarding the cancellation. Uh, I, I thought that the cancellation rate was a little higher. What it was, who was was it a certain from your team who would go and procure, or usually it's another team that is procuring for you, and then you get pictures? Did that affect your cancellation rate? And lastly, was there an alleviation from your protocol? Thank you so much, and that was a great talk. Questions? Okay, we're going to go one at a time. Was there who procured the organs? Most of the time, it was our team, fellows, but now we have now with the different allocation system. We do have a few more um, home teams doing their procurements, but we do do the pictures and video and then biopsy if necessary. Uh, we did have, um, we haven't had very many deviations. There's been once or twice a year where um, after we thought that we weren't going to cancel, but we did for other reasons. Mm -hmm. And we don't really have a time that's actually improved our operating room times from the time that we were scheduled to come in the room to the to out of the room. So we don't have a protocol currently where they will allow us to put lines in outside the OR, unfortunately. But if it is an ICU patient that's seeing it, we already force cuts it down. We do do that we uh, did improve our holding area time to in room time by having the abbreviated uh, set up so we did not have to wait for the room to be set up. They're all ready to go. I think the cold ischemia time is a question. Did it increase the cold ischemia? It, oh, not for us. We have the uh, the ice ready. So if they came, you know, it takes us about mm, an hour ish, depending on the patient issues, if they've had surgery before or not, an hour, an hour and a half. So we've been able to time it pretty well from cross clamp to in the to out of ice. I think our average time is between six and eight hours ish. And I don't think that video is really flush. Okay. Great, thanks so much, Amanda. Your time is Yes, thanks. And excuse me a lot from Tishina. First of all, Miranda, thank you for doing this project. It's really important, and I think every transplant HBV center should have a Miranda. You know, she actually runs the center and she teaches all residents and fellows and faculty. So I know that firsthand from actually from Jella and Will, et cetera. I wanted to ask you if in terms of the OR time, once you do the case, when things aren't open, have you looked at 
how much time is lost because you're having to go find things and open them. Is that something for, because for us, we operate at the VA for our veterans and the University of Colorado Tissue. And at the VA, if everything isn't open, we probably add an hour to your case and time is money in your arm by just going and getting things and then helping you. So I, I'm curious about that. So we have a, a supply storage system that's kind of like a fixus in our room that has all of our have available. Our path that we, the big path that we save to open actually has 95% of the items we need. So we have most of the suture and it, it has actually saved time because it's staffed in a way that our, our board count for soft goods lacks to needles, sharps. It's packed in the way our board goes, so they open it up and they kind of count it as it comes out. So we've actually reduced times with this, and everybody does it the same way every time. We have a very standard setup and regimen, and the the um, trade off of not being able, you don't really say you can't say no or we're not ready. You we have it down to where it should take five or less minutes once. They cross clamped and flush, and you know they were in is good to be accepted for us. Great, right. thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, our next talk is being presented by Dr. Todd Robinson, titled "Survival After Liver Transplant in Recipients More Than Seventy Years Old in the U.S. and OPTN Unos Liver Transplant Post Liver Analysis." Hey everyone, I'm Todd Robinson from the University of Virginia, graduating of transplant surgery. So um, we have no relevant disclosures. As we all know, the U.S. population is aging, with one in five projected to be greater than 65 years by 2030. The, with this uh, comes an increased incidence of multi-organ system comorbidity. And with that comes an increased risk of post-transplant mortality with an increased incidence of HCC and NASH. Um, the use of expanded criteria grafts uh, in, in elderly liver transplant recipients has been shown to be associated with poor outcomes. Um, prior waitlist analysis uh, has demonstrated that with when compared to the younger uh, patient populations, the age greater than 70 cohort specifically had a higher waitlist dropout rate, a higher waitlist mortality rate, and a lower meld at such events, which suggests that these patients do not tolerate higher melds. The challenge is therefore to appropriately select the, the patients who will benefit from the liver transplant in these doge cohort, provide these patients with timely access to transplantation, and also to provide a high quality graft. Living donor liver transplants in this population is currently not well studied. There are single center reports that indicate recipient need should not be a barrier to transplant. And there have been similar outcomes reported in elderly patients uh, compared to younger recipients, although these numbers are small. So we performed a retrospective analysis of the OBTN uh, and UNOS data from 2010 to 2022. Our study group were patients aged greater than 70 who received a living donor or liver transplant versus those who received a deceased donor or liver transplant. We analyzed graft and patient survival based on donor type, and we excluded the recipients who were less than 18 years, the recipients who had a deceased donor graft who were aged 18 to 69, anyone who had had a prior liver transplant, any recipient of multi-organ transplant, abdominal liver transplant, and finally these be graft recipients. So we had 68,125 patients who underwent liver transplant during the study period. We excluded 61,678 and included 6,447 of those. The living donor cohort age greater than 70 were 167 patients. The deceased donor age greater than 70 cohort were 2,849 patients. And the living donor uh, cohort between ages 18 to 69 were 3,300 excuse me, 3,431. We found uh, that the donor age was lower in the living donor liver transplant age greater than 70 cohorts. Uh, the donors were mostly male in the deceased donor cohort, 60% uh, versus 50%. The cold ischemia time, as you would expect, was lower in the living donor uh, cohort, uh, 1.5 hours versus 5.7 hours. And the BMI was, was similar between the two groups. 
in the recipients uh, in the deceased donor cohort age greater than 70, there were a higher proportion of male recipients, more recipients with HCC, more patients who required dialysis one week um, prior to transplant. These patients were more likely to be hospitalized and also uh, more likely to be in the ICU prior to transplant. And there was a higher proportion of functional impairment, less than 50% of baseline. And the MELDs were higher in the deceased donor cohort, open illness slightly, 17 versus 15. The recipients uh, in the living donor liver transplant age greater than 70 cohort had a higher proportion of NASH cirrhosis and a shorter wait time. And that wait time was 102 days versus 170 days. Deceased donor cohort. The length of stay um, was slightly higher, well, four days higher on average in the living donor cohort. Um, but importantly, the biliary and hepatic artery thrombosis uh, rates and other rates of graft failure causes were no different, um, statist not statistically different, at least in the um, living donor versus the deceased donor cohort. The grafts and recipient survivals were similar between the two groups. This is age greater than 70 uh, living donor, deceased donor. We did a subgroup analysis and, when, and we compared the living donor recipients uh, age greater than 70 to the living donor recipients aged 18 to 69. We found that they had a, post, a similar post-transplant functional status, similar retransplant rates, and similar causes contributing to graft failure. We did, however, find that they had a significantly lower graft and recipient survival. So the significance of this is that older patients are more likely to have a higher incidence of frailty and sarcopenia, which is associated with a negative impact on post-transplant survival. Prior study, as I said before, showed that age should not be a barrier to transplantation and appropriately selected uh, recipients with post-transplant outcomes being equivalent in the elderly versus younger cohorts. Elderly patients have a poor tolerance of high ML score. They have an increased incidence of comorbidity, increased incidence of NASH, and a more tenuous waitlist situation. Therefore, uh, providing these recipients with a high quality graph before they suffer that decline in health is imperative. And a living donor liver transplant can meet this need with comparable postoperative outcomes um, and comparable major complication rates with age matched over at living donor recipients. In conclusion, living donor liver transplant for recipients age greater than 70 represents a faster access to transplantation in a safe and a feasible manner compared to similar aged recipients that are going to see stone liver transplant. Thank you. And to comment, we have Dr. Susan Orlock. Thank you. Um, thank you for a great presentation and, and important for and congratulations. You've had a number of presentations uh, at this meeting. And um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Did you assess qualities, otherwise known as quality adjusted life years? I think that's really important in this arena when you're looking at uh, elderly patients and then potentially also the risk of the donor. And I think that Dr. Comfort brought this up in her Mudar presentation yesterday about double equity pillars. And she talked about the young donor into life donor into elderly patient and is that the right thing to do so i'm curious if you looked at that so the double vector pros as well as the qualities and then i'd also be interested in whether you actually <coughs> feel that this is the right way to go to get a fast track for folks over 70 versus trying to <coughs> I realize that the waiting time is shorter and you're getting them access to transplant. What about those younger than 70? So I think we have to think about that in the overall picture. So thanks a lot for inviting me to discuss my curious and thoughts. Thank you. Um, we did not look at uh, qualities. That's a very interesting um, aspect that we have not investigated yet, and I will look into that. <laughs> Um, the double equipoise, Dr. Pontra's comments in her talk resonated with me. Um, and I think you have to look at that in terms of expected, it's, it's a measure, but expected post 
uh, transplant survival. That's something we look at in kidneys and allocation of kidneys, but um, certainly comparing what we hope or what, what the recipients can benefit um, based on their comorbidity. So I think it's an individualized, uh, I guess what I'm trying to get as a reason for transplantation, that should be an individualized approach. And what do we expect? Like, for example, someone with uh, low grade HCC and cirrhosis uh, compared to somebody with a very aggressive HCC outside of Milan, that's not somebody that I think should have a living donor liver transplant. It's a riskier kind of uh, situation. And the same thing with, with cholangiocarcinoma. But I think that um, as it's been shown previously, we can expect a um, an average uh, or just below average um, um, lifespan with liver transplant. And if we're offering them, these patients, appropriately selected patients, um, this, this option, I think that it should be up to them and the, the donor and a discussion, a candid discussion um, on an individualized basis. And then your last question, I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah. Well, the cohort, yeah, the, the, the data for the 60 to 65 and 60 to 70 patients is actually quite favorable. And, and as I said previously, that I think that we can expect a just below average life expectancy for those patients, um, depending on their reason for transplantation. And so I do think that it's reasonable also to perform a living donor. And that's actually the group that's been studied better um, and had and several centers, Japanese centers have a good um, uh, outcome with that and a higher um, cohort of uh, a larger cohort of patients. During the presentation, uh, just a word of caution when we're using the SRTR data. Yeah. I think that, you know, when we read these papers, we, we always have to be careful about who's reading these papers and people read and they say, oh, greater than 70, use a living donor. First of all, I'm going to tell you that it, when people in my own team present, he's 70, but he's a really, really young 72. Trust me, everybody looks 92 the day after the transplant. I don't care how young the 72 looks. <laughs> the other thing is that I will bet you, even though you don't have the range of the age there, that the vast majority of these greater than or equal to 70 are just about 70. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we have we have to be careful when we're looking at them. I'm not saying that you can't do a 70, 71, 72 even a 75. It's like saying, can you do a living donor in a meld of 40 in a very highly selected, very unique person with a very unique donor? And I think that's the important thing that we need to always, so it's not just, you know, in, in well-selected, it's highly selected patients. That's the key, okay? Yeah. Because it's not the norm. All right, and that shouldn't be really the message that we give out, all right? Um, and I think that the important thing really is that the vast majority of the living donors that we're gonna do are, are not gonna be in, in, that, in that group, okay? Because by and large, you have other comorbidities by the time you're 70 years old. If you don't, hey, good for you and go for it. But I think, I get very weary when I start hearing, you know, my own team start talking about the the guy who golfs five days a week and runs marathons and blah, 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 because I've been burned over and over and over doing people who are 70 and more because let's face it, just, you know, you can't beat the aging process and just, you know, the, it, sometimes you, you know, Sometimes you, the bear gets you, you know, and that's one of the ways the bear gets you. And I think you just have to be very cautious when you're looking at, at these pushing the limits in that way. It's not to say you can't do it. It's just, you know, just remember, I, by and large, that's group. That's probably not a great idea, but yeah. not impossible. Our, the oldest recipient, I believe, was 74, and there were only 167 in 12 years in the United States, so this is an incredibly highly selected group of patients, and 
with the, our center, um, smaller than the donor population, but the oldest we've done is, is 59, 60. So it's, it's, and that was even somewhat challenging for a different reason. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Annabelle Gravely from um, Toronto General Hospital talking about factor five as a predictor of graft loss. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting on the topic of factor five as a predictor of graft failure after the transplantation. In relation to this presentation, I have no disclosure, disclosure so I'm going to get right into it. Our study uh, should be placed within the broader context of the donor recipient imbalance, and more specifically, uh, with the recent strategy of implementing extended criteria donors. While this has been effective in expanding the donor pool, it's also led to an increased demand for assessing graph function within two settings. First, within the pre-transplant setting in the assessment of graph viability, but also in the post-transplant setting with the hopes of predicting uh, patient outcomes, graph loss, patient survival. So our study really focuses on this follow-up period and the use of factor five as a potential biomarker for prediction of graph loss. So why factor five? Well, theoretically, factor five should reflect quite quickly functional changes in the liver because of its sole production in the liver and short half-life. But there's also been a retrospective basis for this study. So Gorgon and others in 2019 uh, published a paper considering and finding an association between factor five on post-operative day one and graph failure within this post-operative period. So our aim was to prospectively validate factor five as a biomarker for graph loss post-transplant. Included in our study were adult patients set to undergo deceased donor liver transplant at UHN. In this preoperative period, we collected recipient and donor variables, including common, commonly collected variables such as patient characteristics, baseline characteristics, and disease-specific variables. Surgical variables were also of interest, things like reperfusion time and uh, transfusion, blood loss. Here's where it gets more specific to our study. Uh, on postdoc days one, two, three, five, and seven, we collected an extra um, vial of blood with routine blood work and measured the plasma factor five in these patients. Those routine measures were commonly used measures of liver function like AST and ALT. And then our primary outcome was graph survival at 3, 6, and 12 months. We're also interested in the secondary outcome of patient survival at 3, 6, and 12 months. And we analyzed these both via stratification using a retrospectively determined cutoff of 0.36 units per milliliter. And this was uh, in reference to the paper that I just showed by Gordon in 2019. So let's have a look at our population. Uh, as we can see here, the majority of patients were actually in this high factor five group with only 20, approximately 20 patients in the low factor five group. When we look at our recipient characteristics, these are fairly well balanced. So with uh, no significant P values in that right column there. Focusing in on the donor characteristics, again, fairly well balanced with the one exception of uh, cause of death. So the donor cause of death was slightly skewed between the two populations. In terms of surgical variables, again, um, not much different with the one exception of cold ischemia time, which was slightly longer in the low factor five group. And then once we get into this post-operative period, we can see that other measures of liver function like ASC and ALC have actually increased in the low factor five group. And then just a, a brief glance at our, our outcomes here, we can see a higher proportion of graft loss and patient death within our low factor five group. This is just now focusing in more on this primary outcome of graph survival. Uh, this graph shows 12 month graph survival, but the dots on the graph and the um, numbers on the side represent three month graph survival, which we can see is not significant by the stratification. But as we move forward to six and 12 month graph loss, this does become significant. We can see over 10% difference in graph survival between the stratified groups. In terms of our secondary outcome, we see again non significance at three months, but you know, slight divergence with it overall survival, which continues to diverge at six months, but only becomes significant at 12 months here. Um, less than 0.05. 
So effectively, those you know primary and secondary analysis did show that uh, that cutoff of 0.36 units per milliliter is validated at those time points. But we were also interested whether this was the optimal cutoff within our population. Uh, so we conducted a cutoff analysis, and that's represented here by the ROC curves on each post-operative day. Uh, we ended up selecting a cutoff of 0.46 units per milliliter on post-op day one based on its mutant index and also that it was a cutoff beyond the normal factor five range. We conducted then graph survival and patient survival analysis within this novelly stratified population and found that it actually was significant now at three months. So this is the main difference between our optimal and our retrospective cutoff. And we can see again at six and 12 months, it remains significant. In terms of overall survival, there wasn't much difference between our initial analysis and this, this model cutoff. Um, finding that it was you know, diverging, but not significant at three and six months, and then the eight and twelve months. Overall, uh, we did find that using this retrospective cutoff of 0.36 units per milliliter, that low levels were associated with six and 12 month graph loss. And then with the addition of our new cutoff at 0.46 units per milliliter, it was associated with all time points of analysis. Patient survival, on the other hand, we found similar outcomes for both 0.36 and 0.46, finding that they were associated with 12 month overall survival. So just to bring this to a close, um, in the study, we did validate post-op day one factor five as a binary marker of graph loss. And we've also, also proposed a, a novel cutoff that is yet to be validated at 0.46 units per milliliter. I just want to thank my mentors and uh, supervisors and would like to take questions now. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Let's take a look at what you just said about well, first of all, as I understand it, you're an undergraduate. So I want to just congratulate you because you did a fabulous job. Thanks. And if you ever want to come and shadow and Mike, let us, you're welcome to. <laughs> okay. So my first, uh, my first question to you is, you know, the C statistic on the, um, the 0.36 mm -hmm. in the first paper was almost equal to a coin flip, 0.5. Okay, so how did you come up with the 0.46? Is it because uh, did you did, because of the C statistic being like a coin flip on the first one? How did you come up with that? And so the in our study when we looked at 0.36, uh, we found that it, it was predictive, but and we didn't use C statistic, but found that its sensitivity was only 0.5, which is low. Um, and with our we ended up selecting 0.46 as a cutoff based on the mutant index, which is the balance of sensitivity and specificity. And with that new cutoff, it now has a sensitivity of 0.83. So it was a big improvement. Um, but I think we, we thought the mutant index was a better measure over the statistic in the study um, and in balancing the two things rather than just. And then early allograft dysfunction in transplant has a very specific definition. You didn't define it here. What was the definition that you, you used for early allograft dysfunction? Was it the ALTOF? Yes. Is yes. that what you used? We used the ALTOF criteria, um, and I didn't really touch on it here, but yes. um, I think it is good to note that that is a current um, measure of early allograft dysfunction and a prediction of graft survival, but it hasn't been consistently related with graph survival outcomes. So our hope was that with factor five, not only is it, could it be an earlier measure, but also um, might be more accurate and might be a better predictor of graph survival. And then when you got the results, so if somebody, your patient came out with a lower than 0.46 on post up phase one, did you do something different with them? So I think at this point, there's really, no decisions that can be made based on that fact clinically. Don't want to take too big of a step with it now. Um, as we can see in the graph survival outcomes, those patients with low factor five based on our binary uh, cutoff are still great survival. And it's just there's a difference. Um, so I think at this point, can't be making clinical decisions, but it adds to you know a physician's or a clinician's set of information in that follow-up period that could supplement other findings that might make it something worse. And then my last question for you is, in the transplant world, we're moving into this machine perfusion 
whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. And do you see this as something that might be useful to look at in the machine confusion model? Yes, I think so. I think that might actually be the more interesting setting, um, but it was much easier to study postoperatively because there's not as much access to those fusion systems. But um, it could be a really interesting way to assess graph function during perfusion and decide based on a fact that I measure uh, if that graph is viable or with a combination of measures. And additionally, uh, you know, as machine perfusion evolves and, and maybe gets into more complex models where the person can regenerate or you know, this more advanced style, uh, it could be also a measure of how graph function changes over the time of perfusion has been improved. A plus. You'll like a Colorado better than I consider that. <laughs> I read a great talk, and I would have never known that you weren't actually a fellow or a young attending. Not that you look old, but that's not your, your uh, mature and expertise. And, and uh, thank you for presenting this. I have a question about whether you thought about this or maybe you're already doing it. Integrating the results of thromboelastogram or TAG and how that correlates with factor five. So I think that would be interesting. I don't even know if you use the TAG in your center in Toronto. Uh, it, it is really helpful in guiding blood fire uses both intra-op and early post-op. So I'm curious if you've integrated that correlation and, and if so, um, what you found. Um, I have to say, I'm not sure. I don't know if it's used at your center. I don't have much clinical experience, um, but it would be interesting for a future study of that. that it was Anybody here from Toronto? I am. Um, currently, no, we don't yet. Don't uh, just, in Alberta, and they just it's uh, <laughs> so using tag. It really saves a lot of money because your blood product usage is guided by the tag, and it's so much better than just checking an INR intraop or postop or, or checking your you know platelet count or whatever. It really tells you function real time. So I would see. Yeah, I would like to add Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> another project for you, and then and then yes, and all of it is even. Thank you very much for Thank you very much for the. Our next talk um, is entitled Liver Transplantation Trans in Mexico. Make unmet needs in the face of a public health crisis presented by Diana DeVal and by in close friend. <laughs> Thank you so much for the presentation. And as said, uh, my name is Diana Rosario. I'm a research fellow over at Harvard University. And I would also like to thank the HPDA for the opportunity to present. And this is um, great. Okay, we go to the disclosures. Uh, I wanted to start us off by talking a little bit about end stage liver disease in Mexico. This is the most common cause of death overall. And this equals 115 deaths per day. And as everyone in this audience knows, these patients need an organ for them to survive. Again, liver transposition is key, is the only method that we have. And to understand how liver transportation and how people can access this, we have to firstly understand the Mexican healthcare system. Bear with me, it's going to be very simple. <laughs> um, so we have a total population of 126 million people. And the healthcare system is highly primary, that it's very complex, but for the sake of this presentation, for the sake of the study, we're going to keep it into public and private sectors. The private sector is comprised by the people that can pay out of pocket for the service, right? So it's less than 3% of the total population, which means that 97.2% of the rest of the people have to rely on public health care services. Uh, overall, again, this equals to 122 million people. Uh, the public health care sector is mainly funded by the government. So this takes on a huge toll to the government and again, towards the people. It's really and how about the Mexican liver transplant regulation? We have the National Center of Transplants, for short, it's called Sinatra. 
It includes the private and public focus sectors, and it prioritizes allocation according to the type of institution or organ worker. So what does that mean? If the organ comes from the public focus sector, we're going to try to keep it in the public sector, and the same is true vice versa. If it comes from the private sector, it's, we're going to try to keep it there. It also takes into consideration the male score, so those patients that are have a yeah, more severe disease are going to get a uh, little transplant more likely, and then geographics. And it's dependable on local, regional, and national. So let's say that we have an organ in Mexico City, which is located in central area of Mexico. So we're going to try to keep it to that state specifically, to Mexico City. If there is no recipient available, we're going to go to the regional level, so let's say the whole central area of Mexico, and lastly to the national. And again, as we can see, we have, we see that the public and the private sector can both perform liver transplants, but always having into consideration that less than 3% of our population can access private services. And nobody up to this date has studied the access, so we want to characterize the national trends of liver transplants in the Mexican public and private institutions. And for this, we conducted a retrospective analysis using the Open Access National Center of Transplants, Sinatra data set. We included all the transplants from 2007 up to 2020. Uh, this is the only data that's available. We're still waiting for 2021, 2022 to come, but at this point, this is what we have and this is what we use. Uh, we divided institutions into private versus public, and then we divided these institutions regarding their geographical locations. So central, central western, northern, and southeastern. And of course, we performed the appropriate statistical analysis for our comparisons. And on our results, we see that <laughs> only 1,599 liver transplants were performed in 14 years. Uh, on the graph, we see the yellow shows the public sector. And on blue, we have the private sector. Again, keeping in, in consideration that the private sector is not very available to the whole population, we see that a good amount of the transplants are performed in the private sector. And the drop that we see in 2020 was due to COVID. And when looking at the stats, we see that patients in the private sector were older. They were 57 years older versus the patients in the public institutions. And also the private sector uh, was most likely to uh, operate on male patients, 64% versus 49. This was all statistically significant. And when looking at the region, I want all of us to look at the public sector, we see that most of the liver transplants were performed there. But if we look at the, again, at the fragmented regions, we see that only the central area was the only, um, had the only institutions that were from the public sector and performed the vast majority of those liver transplants. But when we see the rest of the country, we see that the private sector is again performing most of the proportion of this. And I want to know that the southeastern region only performed 11 transplants during this 14 years. This was all again statistically significant. And looking at type of donor, we see that most of the of the organs came from deceased uh, donors. So then we see, and I want to pay attention also to the living uh, donor transplants, which were performed only 12 times in the private sector and 10 times in the public sector. Um, again, not even 1% of all liver transplants uh, were living during the COVID sector. Uh, in terms of limitations, we have a bunch. Uh, these are some of them. This is a retrospective analysis. As you know, there are certain biases that you can have because of this. This is also an administrative database. It's not supposed to serve as a research database or medical research database in any way. Uh, we have no follow-up data on these patients, and we lack the clinical variables. Uh, but again, we still think that this information is super important to put out there. Um, and overall, I just want to say that the number of liver transplants in Mexico is small relative to the increasing incidence of end-stage liver disease. And although the private sector is inaccessible to most of the Mexican population, a significant rate of liver transplants is performed here. And important disparities exist among transplant patients. Women are more likely to receive at public institutions. And living donor is rarely performed in Mexico and is mostly limited to private institutions. Yeah. So, thank you. And our discussion is Dr. Stephen Burr.
So it's a great presentation. Thank you for sending me your slides uh, beforehand. Um, so I just have three questions. Um, so what was the actual likelihood of receiving a liver transplant in the public insurance versus private insurance? Um, secondly, what do you think can be done about the geographic disparity in access to transplantation, especially in patients in the poor southeastern uh, part of the country? And then, what ways do you think, or do you think, the government and policy to improve donation? And as you know, in the United States, you know, kidney allocation is very important. How would you improve or change uh, organ allocation to address access in Mexico? Thank Thanks so much for all the questions. I love them, actually, personally. Um, talking about the likelihood of receiving the transplant, it's super hard to come up with a specific number. But again, I want to take into consideration that the fact that 3% of the population uh, has access to private health care services, and there was a significant proportion of them receiving a liver transplant. So the likelihood of receiving Again, uh, and a liver and the private is very, very high compared to the public institutions. Uh, but we do not have that number yet. We would have to do more math and more research on this. And regarding geographic disparity, I, I think it's super interesting because I've been, well, of course, during this Congress, we've seen how the US is trying to de you know, centralize care. And I feel like in Mexico, you have the opposite problem. So I think it's kind of, Funny, but at the same time, interesting that we have all the centers very centralized. It's basically in Mexico City, in a state called Jalisco, and on the rich area on the northern uh, side of Mexico. And again, what we want to do is actually decentralize it. But like again, the opposite of what we're trying to do in the U.S. I think it's super interesting. That's one of the things. And Talking about, and there's a transplant surgeon over here, I've seen transplant surgeon, uh, who knows much more about this uh, and can speak uh, very well. But um, but overall, we do not have a lot of investment in organ transportation. So I think one of the main things is one, to invest more on healthcare services, invest more on education. Uh, uh, I think it's very, very shocking and very worrisome that only 22 uh living donor transplants were performed over in 14 years so i think education needs to be improved uh asap um and yeah i think it's it's about advocating and putting it out there for for those in, in power yeah. thank you <laughs> our next uh, speaker will be dr diana De oh, oh i'm so sorry dr mariana chavez via from the university of rochester talking about outcomes for patients with colorectal uh, metastases evaluating the liver transplant. Favorite question, usually understanding the denominator. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to me for me to be here today. Hello, welcome to these steps. So, um, as all you know, a growing body of evidence has established the benefit of liver transplant for selected patients with unresectable colorectal liver metastases. The most recent publication from the Oslo group um, has shown that uh, a five and 10 year overall survival after liver transplant is 43 and 26% respectively, which is excellent compared to other oncological treatment options and it is in line with uh, results on resectable disease. In the United States, also a uh, uh, recent publication has shown a one and three year overall survival of 89 and 60% respectively. However, rigid criteria uh, for selection patients um, are required to achieve acceptable long term oncological outcomes, and those patients will not be candidates. Uh, important to mention that sense of the success, success of the protocol is a careful selection of patients uh, who demonstrate sustained disease control with a lot of period before liver transplant uh, in order to maximize the likelihood of no uh, extraumatic disease and favorable to more biology. Unfortunately, patients. Um, are often uh, referred to transplant evaluation very late in the algorithm and uh, as a last resort. Briefly, I just want to mention uh, that our protocol at University of Rochester, patients need to have a really radiological and biomedical response to at least six months of oncological uh, therapy. And for some high risk patients, uh, could be one year um, or 18 months. And that primary tumor needs to be removed more than six months prior to liver transplant. 
So the aim of this work is to analyze the protocol completion patterns as well as alternative endpoints of patients with more acceptable colorectal liver metastasis who were referred to uh, for liver transplant evaluation. For this, we perform a retrospective uh, review of patients with more acceptable disease who were referred uh, to our center from July 2019 to January 2023. Um, we collected the demographic disease characteristics and treatment history uh, from our electronic files, and um, we classified patients uh, in final endpoints of their evaluation for potential liver transplant candidates. So during this time, we had 138 referrals, uh, from which 46% were women uh, with a median age at colorectal liver metastasis diagnosis uh, of 45 years. Regarding the primary tumor location, only 22% had right-sided tumors, and the rest were left-sided with 24% of rectal tumors. Uh, 135 patients were referred from 32 states, and three patients were international referrals. Here you can see uh, in the map in yellow and in the table the, the states that referred at least six uh, or more patients, and as expected, New York State was uh, the one with more um, referrals with 26%. However, uh, um, more than 100 patients were referred outside uh, New York State, as you can see in the, um, the red circles. We also found that 89% of the patients have synchronous disease and uh, more than 75% were considered unresectable at diagnosis. And uh, the, time, the median time between the diagnosis and the referral to our center was nine months. In these times, 30% of the patients had at least one type of local regional therapy, mainly microwave ablation of Y90. Uh, also, 25% had liver resection, some of them with previous uh, PVE. And 17% uh, of the patients had history of fatty artery infusion pump. All these in combination with systemic therapy, no patients uh, most of the times after uh, second or third line of chemotherapy. So after the first consultation and following a uh, meticulous um, evaluation of the medical, uh, medical uh, history and imaging studies, often uh, in um, after the discussion in the local tumor board, the following decisions were made. 49% uh, of the patients were considered potential candidates. 27% of them were potential candidates with concerns of hepatic disease, mainly due to uh, indeterminate lung nodules. 14% uh, of the patients were not candidates due to hepatic disease at the time of referral. 6% were not candidates due to resectable disease. One patient, um, had no evidence of disease and three patients were not candidates due to comorbidities. After the first evaluation and during the follow-up, 81% uh, of the patients were dropped out of the protocol in a median time of three months. 9% were um, are still candidates and are under evaluation and 13 patients underwent living donor liver transplant in a median time of 11 months. So regarding those patients who were dropped out of the protocol, uh, more than one third uh, was due to disease progression. 14% pursued alternative therapy or went to another center. Um, 8%, sorry, 6% pursued liver transplant at another center. One patient didn't find a living donor, and um, five patients were ineligible due to comorbidities. Regarding the disease progression, 14% um, of the patients had local progression, 7% had progression with extreme disease, and 8% had local. Uh, both local and extrapatic disease progression and the most common sites uh, locations of extrapatic disease were lungs in 7% and left lungs 8%. Uh, regarding those patients who pursue alternative therapy, four patients went for hepatic artery infusion point, um, seven patients went for liver resection, six patients continued chemotherapy or immunotherapy, and four patients went for local regional therapies. Finally, those patients who pursue liver transplant at another center, one had a rapid procedure in Europe, two patients uh, had progression before liver transplant, four patients are still candidates on their evaluation, and one patient is not candidate due to, uh, right now, due to not evidence of disease. So uh, in summary, this is the final status. I will only mention the most relevant, as you can see in gray, uh, more than 50% of the patients were not candidates due to progression or extrapatic disease. 
13 patients underwent living donor liver transplant and 13 patients are still candidates but have not fulfilled the, uh, the observation period. And 14% uh, of the patients uh, pursue an alter alternative therapy or went to another center. This is the survival uh, curve of the 13 patients that were transplanted um, with a two year overall survival of 82 and a disease free survival of 79% with a median follow up of 16 months. So um, it is pretty clear that liver transplantation for this indication has increased in the United States in recent years. And currently, 19 centers are listing patients for this indication. For um, what we have learned from our, our experience at the University of Rochester, after all these referrals, only 9% of the patients have reached a liver transplant. However, these patients have had an excellent overall survival. So interestingly, although, although most patients were considered unresectable at diagnosis, the median time to refer to a multidisciplinary center with a transplant oncology protocol was nine months. And in the meantime, um, alternative therapies were used often with palliative um, intent. And here we show that more than 50% of the patients were excluded from the protocol due to disease progression or hepatic disease. And although we know uh, and understand that tumor biology plays an important role in um, patient selection, we also um, think that an early referral to centers with transplant oncology protocols could facilitate the navigation of the best treatment options for these patients. So in conclusion, prior to referral, uh, patients underwent multiple therapeutic alternatives uh, in addition to systemic therapy, making them highly prepared patients and resulting in prolonged uh, referral times. This highlights the need for further refinement of selection strategies, scoring systems and treatment sequencing as more data become available. Finally, uh, we strongly advocate that referral for liver transplantation uh, consideration should occur sooner rather than later in the treatment algorithm in order to ensure all options are raised uh, prior to initiation of treatment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian. I'm Sean Clear from Mayor Rochester. Uh, excellent presentation. And again, I think we're seeing a consistent theme of uh, the viability of uh, transplantation for a delivery of tasks. a very uh, finite, defined, well selected, small population patients. Uh, obviously, I think, and like again, the data seems to be relatively consistent between centers now, which is encouraging. Um, one of the things that obviously uh, I, I think, and again, it's going to be a, a, a publication strategy, but uh, can you help us understand what the chemotherapy, use of chemotherapy either prior to entry into the protocol or in the protocol uh, was? I think that's uh, kind of important to understand. You advocate for early referral, and while you're only going to uh, transplant somewhere between five and nine percent of that patients, that's going to be managing a lot of patients in systemic therapy. So, uh, is that systemic therapy delivered locally, or are you are you do you think it's essential that that be delivered in the center that's considering transplantation? And finally, are there any uh, now that molecular uh, analysis of tumors is pretty pervasive and uh, becoming increasingly important? Do you have any molecular predictors of either a failure to uh, progress to liver transplant or progression to transplantation? Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. So, um, regarding the chemotherapy report, um, most of the patients uh, had. Systemic, systemic chemotherapy before coming to us. And um, as I mentioned, all of them were like in the second or third line of treatment. Um, we need to wait at least six months uh, on chemotherapy with good response to uh, patients be eligible to enter the protocol. We have, we, we right now we do not have the numbers um, maybe more details on the chemotherapy because maybe these will answer this second part of the question because all the treatments are, are not locally. So we are in constant communication with other centers and the medical oncologists most of the times are at, on, at, at other centers uh, giving the, the systemic chemotherapy. Um, regarding the mutation status, so we know that 
uh, on average, 40% of the patients have KRAS mutations of all these four. Um, obviously, it's <laughs> different between those patients who had a uh, more aggressive uh, disease and those that go to liver transplant or are still on, um, under evaluation. 15% of the patients have a uh, BRAS mutation, and of those, uh, those with B, uh, 60, B600, sorry, um, we have five patients with that mutation, and those patients are excluded from the protocol of uh, liver transplantation in others. Thank you for a fantastic talk, which enjoys going to a I think I missed it, but what was your time zero uh, for your survival curve uh, the health point? And then have you uh, done an analysis from the point of diagnosis, from time of diagnosis? So the, the curve that I show is uh, from liver transplant. Um, and I, I do not have right now the, the survival curve from the diagnosis. But we we have all the data, and the plan is to do um, to have that sort of. Thank you very much. And our next talk is entitled "Impact of Donor Characteristics of Hepatocellular Carcinoma Recurrence After Liver Transplantation" by Hamad Wazala. Uh, I'm first year student as well, so I'm excited to present. Uh, the co-authors agree very helpful the project, and uh, everyone here in the state in the last session. Um, uh, we did a project on the impact of donor characteristics on each of the different for liver transplant. We have no financial disclosures. So risk factors for HCV effects um, are predicated on tumor characteristics, uh, pre-liver transplant uh, treatment modalities, some various recipient factors, uh, operative techniques, and uh, potential donor factors. Uh, there's two biggest studies that looked at this. Um, there is one study from 2006 to 2010 using the UNOS database at NCSF, uh, which demonstrated that age greater than 60 and uh, non-local sharing of donors. Um, Increased uh, HC recurrence after liver transplantation. Another study from Geneva, um, we uh, hosted all demonstrated that there was um, uh, increased risk of uh, HC recurrence for donors that had a higher BMI, uh, higher age, and uh, that had a history of diabetes as well. All these studies were before 2012 in the UNOS you know, database that they used, uh, did not have this pathologic study, so all of their pre-transplant data was based off of imaging studies. So um, there wasn't solid information on vascular invasion, tumor differentiation, and tumor process. So our study was to revisit the risk of donor characteristics and graph quality on the serial parents after uh, liver transplant using this new pathologic data from the United States base uh, after it was implemented in 2012. Uh, so our methods, uh, we did a uh, retrospective database analysis using the UNOS of 10 star file. Uh, we did it from 2012 to 2021. Uh, we looked, we included all liver transplant recipients with HEC, which was about 14,000 patients. Um, and it should change that exclusion. So anyone less than 18, we didn't do living donors uh, as well. Um, and the primary outcome was risk of HC recurrence. Uh, our analysis was uh, competing risk regression model and also uh, cost of multivariate uh, regression as well. We looked at various recipient and donor factors in the tumor factors as well. So for the recipient factor, we looked at things like age, gender, BMI, and the etiology of the liver disease. And for donor factors, we also looked at age, BMI, history of diabetes, DCD status, and distance from the factor in miles. But for the tumor factors, we looked at the pre-LT AFP. Um, and then we used pathology data rather than the imaging data. So we had um, the size, the number of uh, lesions, uh, vascular invasion, and differentiation as well. Um, before we started the analysis, we wanted to see if there was a potential bias for uh, using poor quality graphs um, and if those were allocated to patients that had, had a higher risk of recurrence. So we defined our high risk of recurrence as anyone outside of Milan criteria, anyone, any patient with uh, vascular invasion or with an AFP greater than 100. This was different in a horse here also that where they used uh, the imaging total, total tumor volume of greater than 100 centimeters cubed and they used an AFP level of 100. Looking at the 
between the low risk and the high risk groups, there actually isn't much difference other than there was uh, more Hep C positive uh, donors in the high risk group, uh, but that actually that difference went away after 2017. And surprisingly, there's actually uh, more DCD uh, donation in the lower risk group compared to the high risk group. Then we looked at our competing risk regression since uh, our two populations were more or less the same. In the top row, uh, this is that's the data from the RC et al. study showing that there's a difference between donor BMI, donor diabetes, and uh, donor age. And in the bottom row, this is our those are our results from the competing risk regression from 2012 to 2021. You can see there's no difference between BMI, diabetes, and donor age. Going further, other uh, donor factors, and once again, the top line is the RC at all on the bottom is uh, our study. We had no difference between uh, steatosis for the donors, and uh, sitting cutoff time of warm skin time of 19 minutes, there was also no difference in uh, tumor recurrence uh, for their DC donation. <laughs> Other uh, donor factors, we looked at Hep C positive donors, and uh, although the p value is 0.051, uh, it was not uh, significant uh, for uh, uh, HC recurrence. DCD donation also wasn't a predictive factor for uh, HC recurrence, along with uh, shared type and uh, um, donor gender as well. When we looked at the tumor factors for HC recurrence, all of these were predictive of HC recurrence. So AMP level, number of lesions, vascular invasion, differentiation, and tumor size, all those people have another less than 0.01. And we looked at the cost regression to see if there's any compounding variables. Like into donor characteristics, which is in the top section of this chart, uh, there's no significant donor factors that were predictive of um, HC recurrence. Uh, looking at the middle portion of this uh, table, the recipient characteristics that were predictive of HC recurrence were uh, recipient uh, gender, which was male, and uh, surprisingly, uh, Nash livers had a, a less incidence of HC recurrence, and all of the tumor characteristics uh, were that were considered high risk were um, predictive of HC recurrence. So recipients with high risk of recurrence was outside of law, vascular invasion, or an AMP greater than 100, um, and similar donor graph quality, um, except for there's more the use of Hep C uh, donor graphs up until 2017, but surprisingly less use of DCD donors. Um, compared to previous studies, there are no donor characteristics associated with HC recurrence after liver transplant, um, and we're using pathologic data. Um, and the primary driving factor for AC recurrence is actually the uh, tumor characteristics. Uh, some of the limitations, um, the, this is a retrospective review. Um, uh, recurrences could have been missed, especially with uh, and extra uh, recurrences were not reported. Um, there's limited donor steatosis data, um, mainly because it's based off of uh, liver biopsies. Um, allocation systems changed throughout, throughout the duration of the study, so that could be a potential compounding factor. Um, we don't have data on uh, immunosuppression and the use of immunosuppression, which also could play a role in HC recurrence as well. So compared to previous studies, this current study demonstrates there's no significant effect of donor characteristics on HC recurrence after liver transplant. It's primarily the tumor characteristics themselves that are driving the HC recurrence. Um, we obviously need further studies to confirm these results. However, this could expand our donor liver graph pool overall and make us uh, you uh, transplant patient with HC without uh, with less concern for HC recurrence. And our discussant is uh, Dr. Diego uh, Di Sabato. Well, he wasn't here. Oh, okay. Um, well, excellent talk. I wasn't quite prepared to discuss it, but I, I liked the idea. I always thought it was more of a bias that donor characteristics were related to the current HCC. Um, one drawback to your approach is that you're doing it on explant. So in a sense, it's already too late if they're going to have high recurrence. Um, can you do um, a similar study using our uh, CT staging of the tumor, pre-op staging? Yeah, so I didn't, I didn't include it in this chart, but we actually have that data and compared the imaging results of the pathology today to see if they corroborated it. There was actually a difference between the tumor staging on the imaging and the explant uh, uh, tumor. And there wasn't really much difference between the imaging and the tumor. What, added, what was the benefit of getting the next plan was the vascular invasion, the differentiation. So we do have that data, but we might just include it in here. Yeah, I think that would be helpful as well. Dr. Orloff. Hey, thank you. This is not 
Oh, just you. Um, great presentation, uh, great work. I think it's important what you've shown in terms of the donor characteristics because we're kind of thrown off by that. I'm just wondering, and may, maybe I missed it, did you look at percent kill of tumors that had local regional therapy for each transplant? Uh, maybe you said that and I missed it, but I, I'm wondering about that as the effect also for parents in terms of the percent of necrosis of the tumor. No, that's a very good point. I forgot to put that in our limitations. So but that's one thing that was not available in that data set is we don't have uh, the data on the pre-LT treatment modality. So we don't really know the effect of those treatments. So that is a really big thing on whether or not that uh, played a huge effect on the recurrence and what kind of tumor biology we're dealing with. Thanks. That's something you can use maybe yourselves. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Patty, sorry. Uh, talking about uh, COVID uh, utilization uh, without transmission to recipients. Thank you for the opportunity to present. We have no disclosures. At the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there was significant fear related to um, transplantation and use of COVID-19 positive allografts. In late 2020 and early 2021, various institutional COVID-19 utilization protocols were developed to allow this subset of allografts to be used selectively. As studies began to emerge demonstrating the safety of COVID-19 positive allograft utilization, and as our understanding of COVID increased, comfort with the use of these allografts also increased. This allowed the donor pool to be expanded to include COVID-19 positive donor allografts. Because of the fear of safety of using COVID-19 positive allografts, as well as other factors related to hospital resource availability and utilization, transplant rates in the US and globally uh, declined significantly during the COVID-19 pandemic. The, aim of our, the aims of our study were first to evaluate uh, for COVID-19 RNA and post reperfusion biopsies of COVID-19 positive liver allografts. We secondarily evaluated for transmission of COVID-19 delivering kidney transplant recipients of COVID positive allografts and also evaluated for any secondary outcomes related to known complications related to COVID-19 including respiratory complications, thrombosis, and death. An institutional protocol was developed in August 2021, allowing legalization of COVID-19 positive allografts at our institution. Our institution at that time had a vaccination mandate, so all recipients were vaccinated. Donors initially needed to have reassuring chest imaging and could not be dying from a COVID-19-related illness. We performed post reperfusion biopsies on all liver transplants and uh, performed droplet digital PCR on all the samples, uh, evaluating for the presence of COVID-19 RNA. Early in the protocol, patients were given monoclonal antibodies postoperatively, and we then performed nasopharyngeal PCRs on postop day seven for all recipients. However, as comfort levels with COVID increased and as virulence appeared to decline, the protocol evolved. Um, we no longer required patients to not be or recipient uh, donors to not be dying of COVID-19 related illness, and we also stopped giving them out of the following body postoperative. Our impetus for biopsy was based on several studies showing COVID-19 RNA in the liver, both um, post-mortem and in patients actively dying of COVID-19. Our COVID implementation protocol included these post reperfusion biopsies of all livers of COVID-19 positive allergens. From August 2021 to April 2022, we evaluated all liver and kidney transplants that received COVID-19 positive allografts at our center. Livers had post-treatment perfusion biopsies performed, and all patients had post-op day seven nasopharyngeal PCRs performed. In total, there were 33 COVID-positive donors and 38 vaccinated recipients. Within the 33 donors, there were 17 livers three simultaneous liver kidneys, and 18 kidney transplants performed. Of the 33 COVID-19 positive donors, 27 received COVID testing via nasopharyngeal PCRs, and six underwent VAL PCRs. The mean days from COVID diagnosis to donation are shown in this table, and were about four days for livers and almost seven days on average for kidneys. 
four donors did die from direct complications of COVID-19 later in our study um, once we kind of decreased the strictness of our, of our protocol. For recipients, all recipients tested negative for COVID-19 on pre op nasopharyngeal PCR testing. All patients had been vaccinated, although one kidney patient had only received the first dose and had not completed their series. However, the majority of patients had completed the full series and most had received a booster. Median follow-up for our study was 132 days. On post-reperfusion biopsies, we only detected COVID-19 RNA in 10% of liver biopsies. The biopsies were otherwise unremarkable. Some had nonspecific inflammation without major concerning findings, but nothing abnormal compared to what we usually see. On post-op day seven nasopharyngeal PCR swabs, there were zero patients who tested positive for COVID-19 out of the 38. There were no, no cases of mortality or graft loss during our study. Early allograft dysfunction occurred in 10% of livers and delayed graft function occurred in 20% of 27% of cases, which mirror typical outcomes. When we evaluated for thrombotic complications, we noted one case of hepatic artery thrombosis, though this case was likely due to a donor-derived hepatic artery injury noted at the time of transplant. No DVTs or any other thrombotic complications were observed in the kidney or liver groups. Respiratory complications occurred in 13% of patients and included two cases of cases of aspiration in livers, um, one case of or two cases of bacterial pneumonia in a liver and a kidney, and one case of pulmonary edema. None of these were deemed to be related to COVID-19. Our study does have several limitations. First, this is a single center experience, so not all findings may be applicable, applicable to other centers. Next, we did have a small sample size, so it's definitely a limitation of our study. And finally, we did not have any information about the COVID-19 viral load um, preoperatively for the donors, which is definitely a limitation. In summary, in our study, we found no PCR detectable transmission of COVID-19, despite the 10% of liver allografts having COVID-19 RNA present on tree perfusion biopsy. We noted no respiratory complications related to COVID-19 and no related thrombotic complications despite the lung category of thrombosis. In conclusion, the use of COVID-19 positive allografts appears to be a safe practice and should be, continue to be used um, to increase the donor pool, regardless of positive death. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this paper will be discussed by boss, Dr. Ross Group. Or can, can you help me? I know we know your work well. I'm just. Uh... <laughs> Uh, I think congratulations with uh, I think a very important research topic, a great study, and also a particularly very good presentation. Uh, thank you for sending me the slides uh, in advance. Uh, I have two questions. My first question is, so if you look at the difference uh, between 2019 and 2020, it's about 700 liver transplants, so that's about two a day, uh, which where you started, missed for a transplant. <laughs> and so I'm not totally aware about the, the situation was in the US, but do you think these were discarded because of fear of transmission of COVID or was there also to some extent uh, a capacity problem in hospital due to the COVID then? Yeah, so um, I think that it was definitely a multifactorial problem. Um, in the United States, a lot of COVID or a lot of transplant programs either slowed down or stopped completely, especially at the beginning of COVID. Um, some of that, a large part of that was due to fear of transmission to the patients, but also to the teams. Um, there was a high mortality rate, especially early on. And I think that, you know, the staff, team members, as well as the patients were definitely concerns. Um, hospital capacities were also significantly limited. So I think that that's definitely another piece of that. I think it's hard to kind of quantify you know, which one had a higher exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so my, my second question, uh, I mean, you're an expert in this now, and uh, everyone tells us we'll get more pandemics in the future, right? And we try to do everything. I mean, in my sense, we're in Rotterdam. I'm not in the lead of the transfer program, but uh, my partner, Robert Porter, he's, he's trying to salvage every possible liver to transplant. And, uh, and here we're losing seven of the livers. So, 
And uh, the same process in the rest, of course, we really want more DCE, we want to extend the livers. And uh, probably a really important way to harvest more, uh, to discard fewer livers in the future would be to uh, have a better strategy in the future. So, what is your opinion on this? And should maybe, or maybe there is something like a US task force, an international task force, a living transformation negotiation in place, how to deal with the next pandemic? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. Um, you know, I think that the important thing to remember is that every pandemic will be a little bit different. The risks of every new pathogen that comes along that creates a pandemic will be different. I think it's important to remember that people die on the wait list every day. And as we're not transplanting, people are dying. Um, but we also have to limit the amount of harm we do by transplanting in the setting of pandemic. So I think it will just a little bit, unfortunately, depend on what is next. And I think, you know, as happened this time, experts came forward and studies were created. And um, as soon as we felt it was safe to go back to transplanting, we did. And I think that's important for the next one as well. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation of studies coming from Europe. Yeah, non transplant is really sensitive. But I have some experience in my work in Australia at the Columbia uh, more than 20 years ago. Um, maybe I missed it, but um, it, does he, do, you, do you know the uh, vaccination status of the dollar? Was it a uh, vaccine process? You are looking into the ground star in a concentration. Do okay. you know the? Yes, unfortunately, that was a limitation of our study. We did not have donor vaccination status. We only had our recipient vaccination status. That would be a very interesting thing to look at, though, if you have that information. Just like any of the new way of being talk, so. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody, for staying to the uh, very end. Um, everyone have a safe trip home and enjoy interacting with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.